So hello everyone, my name is Martin Hochel. I'm a software engineer working for a company called Embed IT, based in Prague, Czech Republic. Besides that, I'm organizing the NG Party meetup in Prague, which is the biggest JavaScript meetup in Prague and basically whole Czech Republic. Uh, I'm also the author of NG Metadata, maybe you heard that, the best angular JS yet. Also a member of SkateJS team, and I try to do a lot of open source. And when I'm not coding or something else, you can find me surfing, snowboarding, wakeboarding, or skateboarding. Yeah. So, today's talk will be all about skateboarding, okay? So let's learn the fundamentals. This is Oli. You just need to pop the tail, put your front, all right, all right. Maybe next time, okay? So, we are all software engineers. We like to solve problems. So let's create a problem set. So how would you create a reusable widget? Okay, maybe who will pick JavaScript? Shout, JavaScript! Why not JavaScript? Come on. Anyone? Really? jQuery? Yeah. Okay, shout jQuery. jQuery. Not so many voices. What about React? Shout React, come on, I, can't, I cannot hear you. React. <laughs> View? Is anybody viewing this? Yeah. <laughs> awesome! Angular! Cool. Yeah. Oh! Lots of Angular guys. Okay. Uh, all of these are viable options for creating a reusable widget, widget indeed. But let's take a payload size, okay? So this is some convoluted values of uh, implementation size of the widget. Obviously, the biggest one is with vanilla JavaScript because you have to introduce a lot of boilerplate. And let's take a look about the library size, JZIP Minified, that you will need to ship to your consumers of that widget. With vanilla JavaScript, 0K, because it's the platform, right? jQuery, 30K. <clears throat> React, 7 for the React, 42 for React DOM. Wow, that's almost 50K just for one widget. View, 20, nice. That's kind of smallish. What about Angular? 75, that's a beast. Shipping so huge payload size just for one widget. I don't know. It works, but all right. So let's say you pick one of these technologies and you create some catalog of components, right? Maybe you're using material design or bootstrap in various of these technologies, okay? So, uh, and I heard next next year there will be some awesome framework from Alien Planet called FutureJS. What will you do? Rewrite everything! Yay! <laughs> That's ridiculous. Okay, whatever. Let's set another problem. Okay, we have we have reusable widget, and how would you create interoperable widget? What do I mean by saying interoperable? So your widget is basically a black box and you have various consumers and the widget should be able to communicate all these technologies. So, I don't know. I guess it's not even possible to, to do this. JavaScript. JavaScript, okay, that's one option, cool. So, reusable, interoperable widget. Hmm. <laughs> what if I told you <laughs> web components? Okay, so yeah, web components are the answer. So why? Let's, let's talk about a few things. Like why web components, what are they, and how to develop web components. Let's start with why. So again, basically web components are solving both problems, creating reusable and interoperable widgets. Really they do. We will see later in the talk how it's possible. And as I say everyone, Keep calm, dude, and use web components. Deal with it, hashtag. <laughs> so, now maybe you're asking after these few slides. Okay, Martin, so can I create whole apps <laughs> with one web components? <sighs> Spoiler alert. You can, but it may hurt, okay? And it really does. I will show you later on. Okay, we know why. Now let's talk about what is a web component. So it's a new primitive in the platform for creating reusable, interoperable, 
and X really encapsulated widgets without any hacks because it's in the browser, right? So let's say this is some web component. I don't know. According to it, I, I'm 100 years old, so I look pretty good, right? And it renders like this. Wow, how is that even possible? Some kind of magic, right? We are software engineers. We don't believe on magic. So web components is a set of specification based from custom elements, templates, shadow DOM, and JavaScript modules. Let's dig deeper into that. So custom elements, basic building block. How you create custom element? It's just a class which extends from HTML element. Then you have to define it to the global registry with a unique name, okay? And this name needs to follow this format, like prefix, dash, and name of your element. It's very important. And last but not least, if you do this, you already teach the browser new tricks, and you can use declaratively the element within your HTML. Nothing complicated. What about APIs? So we have attributes and properties for communication from parent to child. Then we have events for emitting events from component uh, outside, so basically like data flow from child to parent, and we have also some lifecycle hooks. What about attributes and properties in a terms of primitive data? How you set primitive data? What I mean by primitive data? It's just JavaScript primitives, right? Number, string, boolean. So you can do it imperatively, like the dollar zero is the query element, the custom element. So you can set the attribute via set attribute, but note it's, it will be always a string, or you can set the property because it's just DOM. And I guess you know that every DOM has some properties and you can imperatively set that property. This is how we do here. And then you can declaratively use that element and set the values via these attributes. By the way, under the hood what the browser does when you write such a HTML, it calls set attribute. So simple as that. Let's implement this, okay? This is our custom element and we want to be able to add a behavior for this H property. So how you can do that? First, you need to create some internal stuff, like internal property, in this case H, and it's powered by setters and getters. So set get, set H, and get H. And note this, I'm calling some render method within the setter. Render, it's uh, not a part of the API, it's just my method, which triggers the renders, so uh, I have sync data with view. Not very fancy, right? But it works. Okay? So what if I want to set the property via set attribute? Custom elements provide some custom behaviors that we need to define, okay? So I need to explicitly tell the custom element that, hey, dude, listen on this attribute. Because we can listen on every attribute. It will be performance overkill. And when this attribute changes, there is attribute change callback lifecycle hook, which will trigger. And within it, we are invoking the setter, and the setter is, it gets called, and again calls the render. All right, kind of confusing for the developer experience, but it totally works. What about rich data? Maybe you were just wondering, what rich data? I mean objects, arrays, promises, observables, functions if you want. How to set them to web components? So again, imperatively, just like this, or declaratively, wait, don't do this. <laughs> this is very expensive operation because every time you need to call JS, JSON stringify and parse, and not just that, you will also lose the reference uh, of, that, of that object, and this is crucial for your data binding. So don't do this, okay? Just set directly to properties. Let's implement that. Again, you already know the trick. Define internal property, setters and getters. And again, you have to call this render within the setter. So we already call render at two places. Gosh. All right, what about events? So we just emit custom events. You create imperatively, again, some listener on a custom event. And you cannot do that declaratively. Farmer. This is how it looks like. Again, you just configure the element. You can also send some payload. We have this detail property if you want. And you create a custom event, which is called our trick, and dispatch. Done. 
but all lifecycle loops. Custom elements is a few. So constructor, this is not really a custom element thing. It's just JavaScript class, OK? But you need to call super, because you don't want to break the prototypal and inheritance chain. You want to like maintain the behavior of the super class, which is HTML element. So every time you're creating constructor, you need to call super. Then we have attribute change callback. We already covered that. This is new, connected callback. This is called when the component is physically attached to DOM. And uh, the opposite, this kind of callback is called and remove the element. Pretty cool. Templates is just new HTML tag template, which is inert. What I mean by that, browser isn't parsing this, uh, this content, but you can imperatively instantiate and parse this template during the runtime of your app. Shadow DOM, it's so shadowy. So let's take a look again at our component, OK? There's, there is the SK user, and it has a child of an image. So it renders this, and ooh, how is that? So if you write this in HTML, this is what browser renders, OK? So let's dissect those things. So we have custom element. It has shadow DOM. It renders shadow root with some custom template that we created previously. OK, that's understandable. But what about this image, this child? OK, it's, it stays at the same, same place, but it is rendered within the template on some specific space. How is that even possible? Well, Shadow DOM comes with a very powerful API called Content Projection, and you can do this via this slot. It's basically some portals, right? So it's natively in the platform. It's a very nice API because it allows you to write really composable elements. And maybe you noticed I used the style tag within the shadow root. So let's say I will style some generic known elements like div or ul, and someone will define those styles in some global space or in some other component, right? So what's your guess? They will clash or cascade will be applied. No, there is Gandalf. <laughs> Just kidding. Shadow DOM doesn't leak, and you cannot pierce inside the Shadow DOM. So you are creating really isolated style sheets and components. Pretty awesome. And again, how you construct Shadow DOM, we add this at the Shadow, and then you can attach the template, the Shadow root. And yes, imperative it is, once again, OK? So let's recap Shadow DOM. Is latest sandbox, encapsulated styles, content projections, via slots. What about just JavaScript modules? This is not really a custom element of web component specification. It's just native in a browser, so you need to load those components somehow, right? So now you can use script tag with type attribute and use your ECMAScript imports. And you're good to go. Cool. So we know what is a web component, right? Hey, Martin, what about browser support? Glad you asked. So let's look at the table. I see a lot of greens, OK? So Chrome, Opera, and Safari are 100% compliant with web components, OK? So they work there without any hacks, which is freaking awesome, right? Firefox, you have to use some polyfills. What about Edge? Like Microsoft browsers are always the troublemakers, right? Well, let's look at this tweet, OK? It's on their pipeline. So soon enough, we'll have web components natively in all browsers, except <coughs> Firefox. Firefox is maybe the new IE. I don't know. OK, so let's build a web component, shall we? The reactive and type safe way. So we will be building this SK app, which looks like this. It's an app for learning new skateboarding tricks. Nothing fancy. This is how it works. Let's say I want to learn show it. OK? And it's a really easy trick. Boom. The app logs the event. And it also adds the tricks in my portfolio. And also, you can remove those tricks and vice versa. As I said, nothing, nothing fancy. Just for the demo showcase. Let's think about architecture. OK? So 
with web components, we are inheriting the component model, and the whole app is a tree of components. In this case, we have just a root component, SK app, and child component, SK user. And we want to define some reactive data flow. Okay? So, as an input to the SK user, it will be just name, age, and Twix. As you can see, I'm using TypeScript definitions, because I will be using TypeScript for it. And it emits two custom events, learn trick, and remove trick. Okay? So, first off, let's define types. This is the model of the trick. Let's define attributes, the props of the web component. And let's create some template. I know a lot of code. Don't have to read it, just for imagination, okay? Step one. Step two, we need to define properties, the API of our component. Again, there is kind of lots of, lots of code. Setters, getters, pri private properties, which are not private really. And take a look at this view, okay? This is, again, not some web component specification. That's just how I define view with a specific DOM nodes from the template, which I need to query. And last but not least, we need to register it to the uh, custom elements global namespace. Construction time. Again, create shadow root, append child with the template. This is the stuff I was talking about. You need to imperatively query the DOM and you need to imperatively set the listener for the form when it submits, okay? And last but not least, we need reactions and rendering. So again, uh, we are defining this attribute change callback, which triggers render, and also we want to trigger render when the component mounts, so we imme immediately get reflected values from the data layer to the view. And uh, this is the whole code base. Uh, I stripped the styles because with the styles, it, it will be even bigger. So not very fancy, right? Okay, um, let's take out the talk about interop with existing libraries and frameworks. How is that possible? So, uh, with basic HTML, you can declaratively use web components like this. Unfortunately, you cannot declaratively set listeners, the custom events, or set rich data. Ah. React or Preact, okay? This is just JSX. We are using uh, those JavaScript expressions to set the attributes and properties. But take a look at the tricks. This won't work with React because React doesn't care much about web components and it will stringify the value, which is not what we want. But Preact works with this pretty well. So we use Preact. Really. Angular. Angular has first class support for web components. So you are just using the square brackets data binding. We have attributes or directly to the property of the component. View. Again, top-notch support. Uh, only change, like from basic view is, if a view uh, finds a component that is not a view component, by default, it will set the data binding to attributes. So you need to explicitly tell it via this dot prop that you want to set the value to the property, not to the attribute. This is how you do it. If you want to learn more, more Rob Dodson from Google created this custom elements everywhere, where there are a lot of frameworks that are run against some tests, so you can, you can immediate, immediately see the support and interop with the web components, okay? So like leaders are Angular View, React, React, and all, all other are mentioned there, so check it out. All right, so. Now, maybe you're wondering, this is very nice talk, Martin, but so why? Are, is, isn't everyone using web components, okay? So maybe you registered that I mentioned a few times were imperative, or scattered, or boilerplate. Yes, writing one of, uh, web components is kind of pain, and it's really bad developer experience. And developers don't like bad developer experience. I hear ya. But eventually, you are smart developers, when you start using web components, you will create some own abstractions or some helpers, okay? But I have good news for you. You don't have to do that. We've done that already for you. Introducing Skate.js. 
Okay, what is SkateJS, you ask? It's a reactive, pluggable, Web Components microlibrary, currently stable at version 4. We are working on version 5, which is currently in beta, and we have some stars on GitHub. You can give us your star if you want. What I mean by reactive? So you might remember how complicated it is to trigger renders in the vanilla web components, all right? The render of scattered setters, callbacks, whatever. It's not in skate. In skate, there is only source of truth, like in React state or props. We have just props. So let's say you have some custom logic, and we put some values to the props, and skate will trigger render, OK? And these renders are in asynchronous pipeline, so it's pretty fast, like in React, and reliable, and there are no state mutations. And again, if you want to change some value, you need to emit web components or just custom event to the logic, and logic changes the data, and again, pass it to the skate component, and the render happens, so one-way data flow. What about pluggable? The whole, web co uh, the whole skate library is a set of mixins. Maybe you are just wondering what are mixins. Mixin is just a simple function which returns a class that extends your base class and adds new behavior, okay? So this is basically like multiple inheritance in JavaScript, but without mutations. So the whole skate is, uh, is created from these mixins, uh, composed together, because those are just functions, okay? And this is kind of big deal. With Skate, we provide custom renderers. What does it mean for you? Let's say you have some component library written in React or Vue, okay? Then some other team will start using Angular or AlienJS framework, I don't know. And suddenly they want to reuse their components written in React. So what can they do? Rewrite everything? Nah. You can use custom renderer with Skate for React, and this will just wrap your existing components. There you have it. It just works. And then gradually you can like get rid of the React and use the whole Skate API to look, to make the bundle size much much smaller. Last but not least, uh, Skate comes with fine-grained lifecycle hooks, something like should component update from React, so you can just render once if you want, and we have some plugins uh, in the lifecycle of the component that can be uh, run before and after the renders. So you are, you are in full control. Microlibrary. <coughs> yes, Skate is just 2.9K minified and GZ. Okay, and you don't have to use all these mixins. You can just pick what you want, and then the size will be even smaller thanks to that reshape. Okay, so how to build web component with SkateJS? Let's learn some core tricks, shall we? All right, so uh, we are using as a default renderer, React. Well, that is not true anymore, since beta, which was released this Tuesday, we have no default renderer. What? So you have to pick your own, okay? We don't force you to pick any particular one. But, for example, we'll be using that Preact renderer because I like Preact. It's uh, it's leverage TypeScript, so you have type safe templates with JS6, which is pretty nice. All right. So first off, we need to import with component mixin from Skate and with Preact mixin from renderer Preact. And then we just create some base component via composition. Functional, easy. And now let's implement the component. So this is how it looks like. First off, we need to import some stuff, okay? Then we define props by TypeScript. This component will just include the name property. And then we create just hello class, which extends from our base component. Because we are using TypeScript, we have generics for better type safety. And again, oh, you register the element via native API. Just like that. What about 
props. All right, when we are using vanilla web components, we need to create getters, setters, whatever. Not with skate. With skate, you define properties just like this, okay? You create some static immutable props object, which uh, keys are the property names, and values is a definition of immutable objects. What I mean by that, in our case, we are providing the most common handlers, like for strings, arrays, objects. We will do the, the coercion and uh, reflection to the attributes for you, so you don't have to think about it. It just works. It's super small boil point. And last but not least, because we are using Preact to render, we need to import that H. So when the JS6 got transpiled, the H is there and it's called. And this is pretty cool because now we have single source of truth for rendering. Okay? Render callback. Awesome. And last but not least, because we are using type system in JavaScript, in our case TypeScript, TypeScript is awesome. It's pluggable. So we can declare some definition and extend the global namespace of JS6. So when we will write JS6 with this new custom element, we will get complete type safety during compile time. And let's look how it works. It's some Preact app. <coughs> okay, so I import Preact stuff, I import my component. This is just my app, which is using that component. And TypeScript is yelling at me that, hey dude, name property is missing. Wow, okay, we see name, is name is type of string because we already told that to the compiler. So this works, cool, right? And let's put there some numbers. Immediately I get the feedback because name should be string, not a number. Pretty, pretty cool, isn't it? Web components, what? All right, so uh, let's rewrite the whole app with scale, shall we? Okay, we don't have enough time for that, but if you want to dig more, I prepared, you can check it out later, if you want. And just for visual comparison, this is the component written in vanilla JavaScript and vanilla web components. Uh, it isn't optimized pretty much, like the rendering the list, it's, it gets even more complicated, so it's not top-notch code, and this is a top-notch code with skate, okay? It's definitely smaller, but the developer experience is pretty amazing. Okay, what about some advanced tricks with Skate web components? So, Skate, Skate JS is an ecosystem, okay? It's not just library, we have different stuff. For instance, SSR, thanks to SSR, you can server-side web components or Skate web components, okay? This is a big deal because this was like the main issue that you heard all the time. Okay, I cannot use web components because I need server-side rendering. Here you go. You can use it right now. Then we have Val, which is a library for monkey patching some inconsistencies between the frameworks. So for instance, if you will use Val and Skate, you can declaratively set properties with React, okay? Last but not least, OR is a helper testing library. Okay. So, uh, what's the skate roadmap? Five stable, coming some, some, some soon, or I don't know, maybe. No default rendering core, that's done. Mixings for everything, done. API for turning off shadow DOM, done. This is also very important. Let's say you wanna implement web components for i9. In i9, shadow DOM polyfill, I don't think it works, so. This is a viable option for you. You can turn off Shadow DOM, but still leverage the platform. Server side rendering, done. Testing with Jest. Yep, you can test your web components with Jest. Anyway, the whole test suite for Skate is tested against Jest, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so when will be Skate 5 stable released? Let's ask the creator of Skate, Trey Sugart. Okay, so just need to finish the docs and we are good to go. So if you want to use the beta version, the APIs are stable, okay? If you want to support Skate, we are on Open Collective. Keep in touch on our GitHub or follow SkateJS, Trey Sugart on Twitter or me, maybe. 
and let's wrap this talk. So what did we learn today? We learned why, what, and how to implement web components and why they matter. Then I showcased the interoperability with existing technologies. It just works, okay? And last but not least, we learned about the best option to write com web components today in a reactive fashion with SCADE.js. There are definitely more questions. Uh, I will be having a web components panel draw table today. So if you're more curious, let's go there and let's talk. And that's it. Thank you very much. Bravo, thank you. Thank you very much. We have like uh, two minutes. Do you have any question? It was the perfect talk. <laughs> Everything is clear. No one? Oh, you have a question. Okay, so quickly you can ask a few questions. So, as you have uh, mixins, why not to use decorators? Because they are mixins also. Uh, yeah, uh, well, those, most of those uh, mixins are implemented in that way that you can use them as decorators. But I don't recommend using decorators, especially in TypeScript, because uh, they are using old implementation, it will change, okay? And also, with decorators, you don't get type safety. The type, si type system doesn't know that the class uh, was uh, extended with something. Yeah, so those are main reasons. The next question, have you checked the stencil? It's not a library, but just a compiler. Uh, yes, uh, I spoke with, uh, with those folks at Polymer Summit. And it looks appealing, but it solves the issue from a different angle. Like they're not using uh, native Shadow DOM, they have some own abstraction implementa implementation, which uh, can be issue with interop with other web components or technologies. They have they have uh, specific reason for that, which uh, we in SCADE understand. But you can use it, of course, but uh, you will get much much larger bundle size because there is a lot of boilerplate coming from that compile code. Thanks. Thank you. Give him an applause around. Thank you.